All right, students, let's do a quick review of all the learning targets that are going to be covered on the test tomorrow. Now, there's no way I can promise that this is going to be a comprehensive everything review. It's just going to kind of hit the main point. So definitely go back and restudy the notes, restudy the practices, restudy all the materials that we went through throughout this unit. That way you can do a really good job. All right, let's start with the first learning target, 4.1. I could distinguish pure substances from heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures at the macro and micro levels. Really, what we're asking you to do is to take a look at this classification chart. And we're talking about the right side of this chart. If given a substance, could you classify it based on its composition? This requires you to think like a chemist. If I showed you a picture of something in real life, whether it be like a rock or a, a, a bag of Skittles or something like that, you should be able to look at the composition and go, oh, well, that's either a pure substance or a mixture. Now, it's a substance or a pure substance if it's made of one type of thing, either purely an element or purely a compound. So you can see elements are made of just one type of atom. Compounds are made of two or more different types of atoms, but they're stuck together, which make it one new thing. This could be like water and whatnot. So pure substances are made of one thing repeated throughout. Mixtures are made of multiple different things that are not connected. Mixtures can have compounds and elements in it, but they are separated either in a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. Remember, homogeneous means uniform throughout. That means that each piece of the mixture is uniformly mixed in that mixture, so much so that you can hardly tell it's a mixture. It doesn't have little chunky bits. Heterogeneous, on the other hand, has separated regions or bits that clump out. Um, they're a little bit more straightforward in the fact that you can probably see the little chunks in there. So again, we might show you uh, the composition or of matter on its atomic level, that's the micro level, or we can show it to you at the macro level. We might say, what would we classify this thing in real life as? All right, 4.1 also says I can classify molecules as polar or nonpolar. This is going to relate to the next learning target, but let's talk a little bit about polar versus nonpolar. So we're talking about covalent compounds, and covalent compounds share their electrons, but many covalent compounds don't share them evenly. You can see here that this oxygen kind of tugs the electrons near it a little bit more. So this creates an unfair sharing of electrons. What happens is, is oxygen then becomes partially negative charge because electrons are negatively charged and it's kind of hugged them towards a little bit more. It's partially negative. The hydrogens, on the other hand, become partially positive. This overall water molecule has a dipole, and we say that it is polar because we can see an overall dipole in the molecule with a partial negative end up here and a partial positive end down here. Now, if we stuck two fluorines next to each other, they would also share electrons. That, that's what makes them a covalent compound. They're nonmetals, but they're tugging evenly. There's no dipole here at all. Neither of them has an unfair share. Neither of them is more negative or more positive than the other. Now, just because it doesn't have a dipole or does have a dipole doesn't make it polar or nonpolar. In fact, carbon dioxide does have dipoles. Oxygen is more electronegative. It hugs those electrons towards it, and carbon in the middle is more electropositive. However, if you take a look at this molecule, even though it's kind of similar to water, the orientation changes the ability of it to be polar. Notice that there's not a distinct positive and a distinct negative pole. The positives in the middle and then the two negatives are kind of pulling on either ends, almost like they're canceling each other out. I can't divide this molecule anywhere to make it positive on one end and negative on the other like I could with the water molecule. Now this all relates to the next learning target, the last one in the 4.1 series. I can explain how compounds interact via intermolecular forces. The intermolecular force, inter just means between, it's the force between molecules. So here we have those water molecules. Remember water has a dipole, a partial negative end, and a partial positive end. And those partial ends can cause attractions to other water molecules. This is what makes water water, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, 
those particles have to interact with each other somehow. And it's these weak intermolecular forces that cause them to interact. And that leads us to the other way to classify matter. We talked about the different phases, solids, liquids, gases, and plasmas. Here, if we look at a phase of matter, and this could be water, could be really any substance, this is what those particles are doing. And we're really just talking about their kinetic energy and their intermolecular forces. Solids have very strong intermolecular forces. They're held tightly together but they don't have a lot of kinetic or moving energy. They're just kind of wiggling and jiggling in place. Liquids, on the other hand, have a little bit more energy. We start to heat the solid up with some heat. The liquid particles absorb that heat. They've gained some kinetic or movement energy, and their intermolecular forces are now a little bit weaker. They're able to flow around each other a little bit more. Now, gases have basically almost lost their intermolecular forces. I'd say many of them have. And so therefore, they're free floating around and they've got a lot of speed. They're moving all over the place. And plasma is the same, even more energy and so much speed that the positive and negative parts of the atom rip apart from each other and create a sea of positive and negative charge. All right, let's go on to 4.2. I can model how solutes dissolve in solvents to create solutions. So this is the simple story. A solvent is just the thing that is doing the dissolving. Typically, that's water. A solute is the substance that is being dissolved, like a powder that could be sodium chloride. When you stick the solute in the solvent, it dissolves into a solution. But we really want you to be thinking at the molecular level, what's going on? So let me show you what's happening. Here we have sodium chloride. This is just table salt, and it's in its solid form. Notice all the sodium chloride molecules. This is a pure substance, specifically in a solid form. That's this S right here. If we take and dissolve the substance in our solute, that's water over here, that substance is going to break apart. Now notice when it does so, the positive and negative charged particles separate and they become charged. Over here, when they're solid, they're not charged anymore because they cancel each other out. But over here, now that they've separated, we have a sea of positive and negatively charged pieces. Again, salt dissolves in water. It kind of looks like it disappears. But if you were to test the water, it would actually show the ability to transfer charge. It's what we call an electrolyte. An electrolyte is just a solution that allows the flow of electricity. Now, now we're going to call this substance aqueous, by the way. That's the, the phase symbol to say something has been dissolved in water. This leads us to the next and last learning target that we're going to test you on in this unit. It says, I can write the chemical equation for a reaction between two solutions and predict using solubility rules if their reaction products will be soluble or insoluble. So this is the general form of that. Up here, we have something called the double replacement reaction. Here is one solutions compound. Now we're only just showing one compound, even though technically the solution has many of those substances in it. Here's another solutions compound. And again, it's gonna have millions, billions of these substances in there, but we're only just gonna show one. And this is what happens when you mix them. The arrow shows the reaction happening and they're gonna form two new substances. Now it's called the double replacement reaction because just the two substances are doubly replacing their partners. Now the thing is, is they always follow charge. Positive will always go with negative. So let's apply this to two substances. So here's lead to nitrate. Again, imagine we took lead to nitrate and we stuck it in water. Well, what's gonna happen? That lead and the nitrate are gonna separate, kind of like we saw before. Here's lead floating around, positive two. Again, I'm just showing one, even though we're gonna see many of them in the solution. And here's nitrate. Notice in the solution or in the compound up here, there's two nitrates. I'm gonna kind of ignore that. Just say there's lots of nitrates floating around the solution, but they're separated. They're now become charged. Same thing, potassium iodide. If I dissolve that in solution, potassium will come out and be dissolved and iodine will come out and separate and be dissolved as well. So now we have the solution with these free floating ions, these free floating pieces of positively and negatively charged. Now what they're going to do is go through a reaction, a double replacement reaction, and they're going to change their partners up. That's designated by this arrow. Now when they form new partners, they have to obey that rule of zero charge, just like they did originally. That's why there's two leads here, because it takes two negative one, I'm sorry, that's why there's two nitrates here, because it takes two of these negative one nitrates to counteract the one lead. Now, lead is going to find a new partner. It's no longer going to be nitrate. It's going to be iodine. 
And so lead being a positive two and iodine being a negative one, that means we need two iodines over here. Same thing, potassium is going to find a new partner. Instead of iodine, it's going to go to nitrate. Notice the charges, plus one, minus one. Therefore, we only need one potassium and one nitrate. These are the two substances that are going to be created after these original substances are mixed. And this is all happening inside this beaker right here. Now, how do we know if this reaction is going to happen or not? You might remember the lab we did where we mixed solutions and sometimes we saw a little substance appear and sometimes we didn't. Well, that deals with solubility rules. We need to know what these substances are going to make or what their phase symbols are. And so we use these solubility rules that are found on the back of our periodic table. So here I'm going to see lead to iodide. I'm going to find and look here. On the left-hand side, these are the rules. These are the things that make things soluble or insoluble. Over on the right side, these are the exceptions. So it, basically, it makes these things flip if these are attached to them. So right here, let's start with lead to iodide. Notice iodine is right here. Typically, things with iodine in it that occur are soluble. However, notice that there's an exception, lead. Because this iodine is attached to lead, that means that that substance is going to become insoluble, i.e. we're going to put an S. S stands for insoluble because it forms a solid substance. And again, a lot of you guys are thinking soluble means can dissolve in water, and that's one way to think about it. Another way to think of soluble means that it is still dissolved in water when the reaction's done. Same thing, insoluble might mean can't dissolve in water, or in this case, what really we mean by insoluble is, after the reaction's finished, it formed a substance that became insoluble or became not be able to be dissolved in water. So this substance, these two substances, if you mix them, go through a reaction and they're going to show an insoluble substance, which I'll show you on the next slide. Now, KNO3, notice NO3 is soluble and there's no exceptions. This thing is still going to be dissolved in water. So let's take a look at what that looks like on the next slide. This is relates to our solubility rules lab that we did earlier on in the beginning of last week. Notice over here, here's a great example of that. We've got two clear liquids. Up here is a test tube with a clear liquid. You can see it's still clear as it's being poured. And down here, here's another clear liquid. Now when these two clear mixed, they're clear, but I wanna let you know that they're mixtures. And when they mix together, they do a double replacement reactions. And it just so happens that this substance created one of the two substances to be an insoluble precipitate. According to those solubility rules back here, something became insoluble. Kind of like in this example here, this lead to iodine became insoluble. So this yellow stuff right here very well could be lead to iodine. Now this potassium nitrate, that's just this extra clear stuff in the water. Nothing happened the, to the potassium nitrate. It's still dissolved, no reaction. But that, le that lead to iodine right here is the insoluble precipitate. And here's a bunch of different examples of those. I'm not sure if the lead to iodine actually creates a yellow substance, but it might create a white substance. It might create kind of a foggy, white, snotty substance, this waxy looking substance. But anyways, anytime you mix two solutions, and they form something that is an insoluble substance. We call that a precipitate. We designate it with an S, and that's what this is going on. So going back to that learning target, that's what that's all about. I can write the chemical equation for a reaction between two solutions and predict using solubility rules if their reaction product will be soluble or insoluble. If both products turn out to be insoluble, if they both turn out to be aqueous, then no reaction happened at all, and everything would just either remain clear or colorless or whatnot. All right, we are not doing the last target, target 4.3 for this unit. We'll cover that when we get back from break. Uh, but thanks for bearing with me. Take a good time to study those learning targets and get ready for the test tomorrow. Good luck.